Hello, everyone. Uh, that's good. You can hear me talking. So, hello, it's David Nankfell here. Um, I've just stopped sharing this. Hello, hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, I'm David Nankfell. I'm chair of the IET Midlands Power Group, and we welcome you very much to um, our first of this session, which is the uh, Professor Toby Norris Memorial Lecture. And uh, tonight it will be all about electric vehicles and the networks uh, that are required to do it. We're very fortunate to have uh, Richard and um, associates come and join us to talk and we'll, I'll introduce them in a second. Um, firstly, uh, welcome to everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for joining. Um, this is the first online session that we have done as the IET Midlands Power Group. Um, we're very much looking forward to seeing how this works. Um, a couple of things just to go through uh, for housekeeping. Uh, there is a Q&A button, hopefully somewhere on your screen in the Zoom. Um, for the question and answer session at the end, uh, what we'll be doing is uh, using the uh, questions that are in that Q&A section. Uh, there's too many people on the call to be able to sort of take uh, verbal and video <laughs> uh, questions as we go through. Um, so, so if you can please put your questions in the Q&A section, uh, not in the chat, so feel free to use the chat, um, but um, put your questions and then we can, we'll look at those and we'll read them out as we go through um, to, to Richard and research at the end. Um, so the next element I've just got to cover, so um, we're going to be showing the slides. Uh, Richard will be uh, sharing those on the screen shortly. Uh, but firstly, I'd just like to introduce the, the session. So this is the Professor Toby Norris Memorial Lecture. Uh, Professor Toby Norris um, was from Aster University, had many, many years in the um, electrical industry and hugely experienced, very knowledgeable, and in fact, set up the IET Midlands Power Group that you're um, joining today. Um, along with Andrew Roper, who I think is also on the call somewhere. So welcome, Andrew. Um, and, and so, you know, sadly, a few years ago, um, Professor Toby Norris passed away. Um, and so in his memory, we run this lecture as the first one of our session, because uh, it feels right to do it as the first of our sessions uh, each, each year. Um, so this is the, the lecture for that. And so it's, it's very important for us to, that we, we get really interesting topics and topics that Toby would have been fascinated by and I think today's um, session will be just that. So uh, very shortly I will introduce you now to our speakers. Um, so we have uh, Richard Hartshorn and he's the EV readiness manager in uh, SSE networks um, and Masej who does the technical modeling uh, working with Richard um, and I think that probably they can introduce themselves to, to all the bits they're doing and working on. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Richard and the Sedge. Over to you, Richard. Afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Or evening, rather. Uh, the day's flown by. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm Richard Hartshorn. Um, I'll just bring up my slides. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you for your time this evening. Um, so as David said, I, I am the electric vehicle readiness manager working for Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks. I'm uh, really delighted to be able to talk to you um, about how we're working towards uh, having the infrastructure in place to meet the net zero ambitions in the UK. So in terms of an agenda, well, I'll give a brief overview of who we are um, and the low carbon technology uptake that we're experiencing so far. Um, I'll touch on our electric vehicle strategy and a few other initiatives uh, that we've got in place that justifies what we're trying to do here. And then I'll cover the ask, which is what we actually wanted to achieve from this particular piece of work. 
Following that, we'll dive into a little bit of the detail around the projections for electric vehicles. Um, and then Mache uh, will pick up the network impact analysis because all of this is great, but translating that into an impact on our networks is the key part of the puzzle. And at the end, we can wrap up with some good old fashioned Q&A. So just to give some context today, um, as I mentioned, uh, Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks, we own and operate two distribution networks uh, and one transmission network. We cover the north of Scotland um, and part of central southern England. Um, and our core purpose, as you can see there, is making sure that we can provide this safe, secure and reliable supply of electricity um, to a, a decent chunk of customers. So it's, it's 3.8 million homes and businesses um, that, that we supply with electricity there. And our vision is to make sure that we can actually have the networks in place that can meet the government's um, ambitions, uh, but also those of our customers. Uh, and to do so in the, the smartest, most cost-effective and timeliest manner. Now, in terms of LCT, low carbon technology uptake, at this point in time, we have approximately 45,000 electric vehicles registered within our license area, or license areas north and south. and Linked to that, there's approximately 40,000 EV chargers that have been installed. And not forgetting heat, uh, there's approximately 20,000 heat pumps that have been installed to date as well within our license areas. So that sets a bit of the scene for now. Back in March, we launched our electric vehicle strategy. So this was built up over the last couple of years using stakeholder engagement, workshops, uh, some innovation projects, and some future um, vision thinking to try and build up that picture of what's the state of play now and what are we working towards? And crucially, it interlinks uh, and builds upon two of its sister documents. We've got a digital strategy that's been published and a DSO strategy, because as a network operator, uh, we are moving to becoming a system operator and that lays out some of our, our thinking about how we'll accomplish that. And it's very much focused on our stakeholders' experience. So just to touch on that, um, within it, there are a number of visions that we have for our customers, our stakeholders. So whether you be a domestic customer, a commercial customer, maybe you're a local authority, or maybe you're a charge point operator or an infrastructure provider, we've laid out some of the visions that we think should be in place um, later in this decade. And we're working on achieving a lot of the aspects that we lay out in these visions right now. Um, and hopefully we will accomplish most of those in the coming years. Um, but we do expect to complete those within the, the time frame of 2020 to 2028, which is uh, the price control periods that I'll touch on a bit later. So a lot of these are capabilities that have been requested by stakeholders. Now, the strategy itself is underpinned by five key principles. Um, I won't go through all of them here, but the first one is the key one, and that's what we'll be linking into today, which is the principle of using data and analytics to underpin a lot of this work, to anticipate where we'll get issues on our networks, to support that decision-making process, and to make sure that we have the right infrastructure in place ready for whatever the pace and scale of EV uptake might be. and underpinning each of those principles are a series of actions. So in the strategy itself, we dive into a bit more detail about what we're working on to, uh, to make sure those principles can be accomplished. And within it, we have helpful links to show where there are links to the digital strategy and the DSO strategy. And in addition, there's also some useful boxes just to draw out where stakeholders have highlighted we really should be focusing on particular areas. And nothing like a shameless plug, we also have some case studies in there which highlights some of the other initiatives that we're undertaking. And it's just a small part of our, port our portfolio, um, but more detail can be found within um, the strategy. There's hyperlinks, or you can reach out to us directly. But we cover things such as our, our decarbonization of our own company's fleet, uh, our rolling out of low voltage substation monitoring, our strategic partnership in Scotland, and also uh, lo Local Energy Oxfordshire, which is uh, Project LEO, one of the biggest DSO projects uh, to be undertaken. And also worth taking the time to say that a lot of that work in the strategy, whilst it's been built up using stakeholder feedback, it's really important for us to make sure that it evolves to continue to meet our stakeholders' needs. Um, so it'd be great if, uh, if anybody is a stakeholder of our license area, if they would like to uh, give us some feedback, it can be found at their website, sscn.co.uk slash ev. And also it's anonymous, which I know helps a lot of people feel comfortable giving their feedback. Okay, so some of the other initiatives that have been driving forward our need 
um, to do this piece of work. We launched um, in July Accelerating a Green Recovery, um, which is a document laying out some of our proposals and recommendations for government to ensure that we can have the world's most extensive EV infrastructure by 2025. And there's a couple of key points that I've just drawn out on the slide here uh, amongst the recommendation uh, recommendations. One is around empowering communities. So having local area energy plans. We'll talk later about how we've disaggregated a national scenario down to our, our local network level, but local area energy plans allow it to be built up from the bottom up as well. And that provides a great source for communities to be empowered to make sure they have the right infrastructure in place for what they're looking to do. We also suggest bringing forward um, the ban on the sale of ICE vehicles to 2030. And we also make recommendations about trying to unlock private investment for charging infrastructure. Uh, we note some of the examples from the Netherlands where um, there was a tender carried out for a large area um, with a number of charge points that are expected to be installed within that. And it secured the economies of scale that meant there was tens of thousands of charges being installed. And that's the, the model that we think should be emulated in the UK to try and achieve this, this widespread rollout. So we needed to feed into that work as well. Um, and finally, as a network operator in, in the UK, we're, we're abiding by the price control periods that the regulator Ofgem set. So coming up next in April 2023 is our next price control period called Rio ED2. Um, and we have to put forward our business case to ask for the budget that we need for the invest necessary investment in that period. And this work will be feeding into that business case that we'd be putting forward. And it needs to be underpinned by a lot of evidence, um, cost benefit analysis and stakeholder support. So we're using this to help feed into that to try and ensure we can hit those three core principles that you can see there, that it gives value for money, that it embraces innovation and it's transparent as possible. So enough about setting the scene, now to the ask. So this is what we went out with and said, okay, we know that's where we are. We have a vision for where we need to to get to. So we really need far more granular projections of what LCT uptake might look like in the future um, that will allow us to make far more accurate investment plans. So really we need to know where, when and, and how much we're going to see in terms of EVs and heat pumps and the like. And we also need those down to pretty much an individual street level. So we have about just under half a million low voltage cables in our networks and just over 100,000 secondary transformers. And above that, obviously, we've got our HV and EHV networks. So we want those projections down onto those assets. And we'd like those projections to be based on National Grid's future energy scenarios, plus a net zero view as well. And not just stopping there, uh, we said to our analytics team, we also want to have effectively a red, amber, green status in terms of overload risk for every asset. And not just being content with good old fashioned Excel, we'd like to have some slick visuals so we can slice and dice and drill down into those outputs further. And importantly, we'd like it to be in the form of a tool that we could use to engage with local authorities, uh, local government, national government, to try and help inform and understand their plans. So that is the ask that we went out with. And hopefully now we can give you some insights into what we accomplished. Now, in terms of these high granularity uptake projections, uh, I'll take you through this section now. So to recap, we wanted to get projections for electric vehicle chargers, heat pumps, and oh, sorry, I failed to mention solar PV as well, um, not forgotten. Um, and we wanted those down to 400,000 or so low voltage feeders and about 100,000 distribution substations. And the crucial thing was we wanted the numbers and the capacities that we could expect to connect onto our network every year out to 2050. Now on the right, giving you a slight little teaser there to show one of the views from the report that we were given at the end of the, uh, um, the, the, the projection uptake study. And this was showing in, uh, in the area um, how we could expect off street home charging to take place in Swindon. So it's, it's mapped out the areas where there's like to be a high density of off street parking um, and off street, sorry, charging, and there is where there's going to be a low density there. So in terms of technologies that we assessed for electric vehicles, there was seven types. We looked at, as you can see there, everything from buses and coaches to cars to light goods and heavy goods vehicles and even motorcycles and a couple of uh, you know, hybrid options in there as well. And for heat pumps, we also had electric and hybrid options. And then for the electric vehicle charger type, 
types we also had eight different charger types we considered because it's really important for us to be able to understand what the difference is um, on our network between home charging workplace charging fleets or depots uh, and then if you had en route chargers like a petrol station and if that's a local petrol station equivalent or if it's like a national equivalent so you might find on the motorways so there's a lot of different technologies which fed into these scenarios and just hammering home um, probably because we are quite proud of it <laughs> the uh, our, our, our consultancy firm Regen, uh, a big call out to Regen for doing this piece of work for us. They brought the national um, national grids, national scenarios down, uh, disaggregated them down onto our, our low voltage networks. And you can see an example in the map there, that's Reading. Um, that's the center of Reading and they've broken up with those polygons about different areas that are supplied uh, by different sections of the networks. And, and that's how they've been able to apportion their projection to our network. So it gives you an idea about the level of detail that they've gone into and, and the complexity of some of the algorithms that they were been running. Now, just for some folks that might not be familiar with us, uh, we won't hold it against you, not many people are, but we have some, uh, some pretty different challenges considering we run a network in the north of Scotland and one in the central southern England. Uh, for a start, winter seems to be um, tackled slightly differently, um, but it just brings out in this slide some of the challenges we have in terms of fuel poverty as the top line there. I mean, approximately 10% in the south of our customers are in fuel poverty but that jumps to a massive 40 percent of homes in our northern license area and that again has a, a slight impact um, in, in terms of some of the projections that have been provided and there's other elements in there that you can see around the number of properties connected to the gas networks for example which again informs the heat pump projections um, local authorities which ones have got climate emergencies um, and the, the typical mileage of the vehicles as well and the propensity of off-street parking so a large number of factors that are taken into account anyway uh, before Regen delved into the detail further. So in this slide, um, on the right hand side, I'll start with that because everyone's eye gets drawn to it first. This was in our light, southern license area, the time lapse for off street EV charging uptake that was being projected out to 2050. So it, it's not particularly easy to pick up from here, but um, there's a lot of areas outside of cities and town centers that we are projecting to see high levels of uptake over the years. Um, a lot of it is driven by those that appear to have um, off street parking and a certain level of affluence, but affluence again is a tricky factor um, to weigh in on. So um, the guys over at Regen, they started out with their baseline assessment. Um, they took the national grid scenarios. They would then look down at the local areas, understand a lot of the nuances, look at the socio demographic, socio economic data, look at the housing stock data. A lot of a lot of data sets pulled together, and, and I won't go into all of those, but then that allowed them to crunch the data to allow then the spatial distribution of different charger archetypes across the areas. And then in terms of informing that, they would also look at things such as traffic flow data in an area to understand what would be the likely routes that we would expect to see vehicles going through an area. And that might then again inform the usage rate of perhaps uh, local charging hubs uh, and the like. And then they went into some areas to actually validate some of those assumptions and drill into the detail and help refine the model further. Now I mentioned this net zero scenario we are after. Um, the work was done on the back of National Grid's 2019 FES. Uh, and so at that point in time, there was just a sensitive around net zero, we asked Regen to come up with a dedicated net zero scenario. Um, and so they produced one for, for us. And as you can see on that chart there, um, the, the, the upper lines represent what we would expect to see in terms of EV uptake in our southern license area, and the lower lines are reflecting the Scottish license area. Um, so for Scotland, um, the net zero changes didn't seem to make a, a huge amount of impact, but you could see for the southern license area, it did bring things forward. You, you can see from the dark green line there, it's accelerating that uptake as you might expect. But then there is a reduction in the total number of, of, um, of EVs. And again, that comes through from some of the considerations they had around the, the changes to vehicle usage habits and patterns, um, the, the perhaps pushing of cycling and walking as per um, recommendations from different organizations. And uh, there's reports and the likes of the Committee on Climate Change that have big pushes for uptakes of cycling and walking in public transport as well. So those trends are affecting that net zero scenario um, and it led to a reduction in the total vehicle mileage for vehicles um, and bringing forward that ban um, and then also dropping the number of vehicles that are on the roads entirely. 
So some of the results that we saw off the back of the, the projections, um, on the bottom left, the table there is looking at the residential off-street charger numbers. So uh, we split it into first, whether it's the Scottish or Southern license area, uh, and then under the different scenarios, the, the thousands of chargers that we would expect to see associated with domestic off-street charging. And the main thing to really draw out is that in a net zero scenario, um, we're expecting this huge jump between now and 2030 and another similar huge jump between 2030 and 2040. So that has already given us some, some kind of pause for thought as to what we might expect to see as challenges on our networks. Significant numbers from the baselines of a couple of thousand uh, in Scotland and you know maybe just over a dozen and a half thousand um, charges in the south um, at a domestic level you know, jumping up to nearly nearly a million charges in the South by 2030 in a net zero scenario is pretty astonishing level of growth. And with that comes the challenges for our networks, all the way from the high voltages as that load gets aggregated down to uh, an individual asset level. And Mache will take you through that in a minute. And then looking at the, the impact in terms of capacity, uh, on the right, you start to look at all the non-domestic um, charges. And if we start to look at actually what that means in terms of the amount of energy that we're looking at, I mean, in every scenario, we're projecting a fairly decent level of on-street charges to be in place. Um, and you can see on those horizontal bars, uh, the dark bluey green uh, teal, if you will, if I'm gonna consult my Dulux color chart, I think it's teal. Uh, the teal section of the bars represents Scotland and the lighter green uh, represents uh, our Southern license area. So you can see the slight difference in scale of the amount of energy that we're expecting, but still significant nonetheless, uh, and certainly some, some major implications for us on different voltages of our network to connect those. So to dip into a couple of areas to look at the results, uh, on the left, we've drawn out um, a high level, you can see Scotland in terms of off-street parking again uh, and we've looked at this for every low voltage cable um, and uh, if it's light blue there's there's probably a low level of off-street parking and off-street um, charging availability in dark blue obviously higher uh, and we've drilled into Aberdeen um, and it, it all makes sense for us at the centre of Aberdeen uh, notorious for some of its lack of parking um, and you can see that from the light blue shading and um, that's reflected there and as you step out into the more rural areas obviously the level of off-street parking goes up considerably so uh, yeah, all seems to make sense, all good on that front. And then on the right, looking down in the Solent at Southampton, um, looking at the spread of non-domestic EV charger uh, types, um, each dot, it says, oh, it says there on the asterisk, but each dot represents a, a distribution substation um, and the color coding reflects as to what's primarily behind um, the charger types um, connected to it. So there's an awful lot of orange and, and um, light yellow um, dots and they represent the fact that an awful lot of substations in Southampton we are expecting to be dominated by on-street charging. Again, should come as no surprise when you look at the housing types uh, and the propensity of um, on-street parking. Um, but again, it's useful to draw it out and the level of detail that they've gone into gives us real confidence. For example, we've been able to see that in some areas, there is a neighborhood that's only, I don't know, 200, maybe 400 meters apart from an, another neighborhood, look very similar in terms of housing stock, the types of um, you know, uh, residents that live there, the level of affluence, or as much as we would expect, uh, similar levels of off-street parking, but slightly different uptake rates, which do end up having a, a pretty significant effect on the local network because they are served by different sections of the network. So previously we would have assumed that all would be fine, it would be a fairly uniform uptake rate across those areas, but thanks to this level of um, rigor and detail and granularity for the projections, we now have the understanding that actually we can go down to a further level of understanding and think that well, you know, one neighborhood will probably see a faster uptake than another. And that again helps achieve that first principle, that first outcome of using data analytics to effectively anticipate the issues. So that is enough from me at this point. I will stop sharing and hand over to Mache. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll try to share, start sharing. Thank you, Richard, uh, for the introduction and uh, piece of the region work they have done. So Richard showed uh, you an example where 
the EVs chargers of EVs will will appear uh, and uh, an uptake of them. But the more important for for DNO uh, for distribution network operator is what actually uh, the, the 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 uptake of EV chargers will have on on our assets. So our um, LV feeders, distribution substations, HV feeders, and this is what we were trying to do with the data analytics team and, and all the data available uh, to us. Um, so just on the right hand side, uh, we've got a list of uh, systems uh, we've used to put the data together. There is a lot of acronyms and, and it doesn't really matter what they are. It, it's just a, a data set we try to put together. And you can you can imagine those as the, as each sort of uh, square represents a, a, a puzzle and with let's say thousand pieces. So what we've done, we put all the pieces together just for fun. We we removed few of them so it won't be too easy, and we try to rebuild the whole system, will linking those those pieces together, and 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 that was a, a, a definitely a challenge. Um, as you know, we've got the lower on the LV network you go the more data you've got. So we've got more distribution transformers than the primary transformers. And again, we've got, uh, as Richard mentioned, almost 4 million customers connected to the network. So trying to put all those data together uh, 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 took a lot of a lot of effort. And also, as you might imagine, uh, that the data sets do not match exactly. So we spend a lot of time cleansing the data uh, and trying to make sure that they all aligns uh, Together quite nicely, so that was a big challenge. I think we we've done quite well with that. Uh, and the next step really was to to, to lack of the loading and, and and our assets. Um, just a few about a few challenges we had with the network building the network model. Um, as you can imagine, uh, each cable is represented by by number of sort of uh, data, uh, and it's got its own specification. Uh, so it could be copper or aluminium, so the type it made uh, as as well, you know, the size, uh, and also a, a, a construction uh, or, or the type of the cable. And you've got a few examples on the HV cable where we sort of showing what data is available and what data is not available. So we, we can have in one section, we can sort of see that on the right hand side, we've got aluminium 240 uh, uh, XLPE cable. But going down, it changes to 0.3, then it changes to copper, but also we don't have the information of the constructor. And of course, that affects estimation of the uh, capacity we've got on the network. And again, we need to deal with that, that problems in our estimation, how the EV uptake uh, will affect those assets. I'll show you some, some impact of that on, on the few more slides. So we've got a number of uh, EVs, uh, in particular uh, ARIA. We, we can have a look how many that will uh, be on particular LV feeder or distribution substation. But as you can imagine, usually the domestic EV charger, uh, they are seven uh, kilowatts uh, in rating, but they will not always be uh, charging at the same time. So instead of looking at the numbers of EV chargers connected, we need to look actually at the, how much capacity we will need on the individual uh, feeders uh, or distribution stations. Uh, and uh, we need to look what is actually the diversity, uh, or what diversity we can apply uh, for, for, for each asset. And as you can see, we've done some analysis and we try to estimate the demand. So up to sort of four EVs, uh, we assuming there will be no diversity. So we've looked at the 95% certainty that you know how many EVs could charge at the same time. So from our estimation, it looks like you know four customers on individual feeder can charge at the same time, but it will drop very very quickly the more EVs we've got. Uh, and sort of looking at the hundred uh, uh, EV chargers and one point we can reduce the, the, the capacity require, required for a single charger to almost two or below two kilowatt hours. However, we've got our own standards, planning standards. We 
we uh, need to assess uh, and, and make sure that the feeder will, will be supplying the, the, the road it, it needs to supply. So we had to adjust you know, our estimation and our planning standards to, to implement that into, into our model. So that helps us to estimate how much capacity we will require on the network. Uh, but that doesn't tell us when and for how long that, that, that uh, design capacity will be required. And that's the bottom graph you can see uh, we try to do on the half hourly basis. So we've looked at the profiles, we look at a lot of previous projects uh, which used uh, and collected the data of EV charging, and we try to exactly estimate what is the capacity required for, for each individual uh, EV charger or collection of them at each time uh, during the day. So you can see we are estimating that around sort of uh, just after midnight, uh, for uh, 1 uh, a.m. in the night, that's where the, the, the highest capacity uh, will be required. And it, of course, it drops uh, in, in the middle of the day and picks up again you know, in the afternoon. So no, nothing surprising. Again, that will depend uh, whether we've got smart charging, time of use tariffs. So that we will need to reassess probably every year to see how people people respond uh, to, to to different signal different market signals and how much capacity for each half an hour is required of course that you know our substation monitoring which uh, richard mentioned will definitely help us uh, with estimating uh, that capacity requirements uh, as I mentioned before, we put a lot of different uh, data uh, types uh, into our model. One of them is our Pi historian. So Pi historian gives us the load or measurement of the load on the 11 kV feeders. And that is really the last point where we've got a real time measurement. Below that, we've got distribution substation uh, and LV feeders. and and unless we've got a substation monitoring, which we're starting to roll out, but it's still quite small compared to the number of assets. So, so HV feeders is our last point of measurements. And you can see at the bottom, a sort of real time uh, graph. Uh, it's a daily sort of profile. You can see the sort of similar you know, for the domestic customers, it, it is quite forward and on the top uh, right hand side you can see sort of a heat map of of that profile of what time is the highest load which is sort of a very light yellow and when we where we've got some capacity of the, on the network uh, which is sort of darker color and then again it tells us estimating on the, on the existing load where we've got a, a capacity and when we can provide that capacity to, to, to EV chargers or, or heat pumps uh, and PVs as well. So that, that allows us to, to see that the, the base load on the HV, but a little bit help as well with the distribution substation and LV feeders. But that's not enough really to assess the, the, the loading uh, down the, the HV feeder. So we've used some additional data. Uh, we've used uh, uh, annual consumption data for our customers to estimate what the, the, the uh, profile and the peak demand could be. We've used the standard profiles for different uh, uh, properties, different uh, customer types, uh, and try to, again, estimate the, 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 the load, the existing load on the LV feeders and the distribution substation using different So in, in that piece of work, we, we've done uh, two approaches, which one is from the top to bottom. So we've used those data you can see at the moment, HV feeders, and we try to estimate, you know, distribution substation and LV feeders. But we've done as well the approach from bottom uh, to, 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 to the top. So we've used the substation, sorry, we've used the customer's data, like annual consumption and the profiles and build up from the, the bottom to the top. And again, we, at the end, we try to compare uh, those two estimates and see whether they are close enough or not. Uh, our substation monitoring from the substation, substation helped us to validate the algorithms and came up with the with the best solution. Again, there is plenty plenty you know headroom for improvements, uh, but at least we can assess that on the very low sort of LV level, a feeder level uh, basis. 
So having all that load estimation, uh, having all the network, now we're ready to, 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 look, to look, at the, look at the impact of all that on uh, our assets. And the first we 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 showing here uh, the AV HV feeder view. Uh, you can imagine we've got on the uh, sort of the graphical representation here in the middle. Uh, substation will be somewhere uh, in the middle of, of that uh, spider from 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 the cables coming out. And we've got number of uh, feeders. We've got five HV feeders coming out of the of the substation in different directions feeding. Uh, low voltage network. So as you can see, we've got a, a number of different representations. Let's start with the uh, data quality view. As mentioned before, we are looking at the different types and the specifications of the cables. When we've got everything uh, in the data sets, we mark it as the green, so all good. We don't have any uh, un uncertainty regarding the quality of the data. But, but as you can see uh, in feeder 15, for example, we mark this as the red because the sound data are missing and we're highlighting the actual certainty of the capacity available on that feeder might be actually lower than, than we estimated or might be higher than we estimated. But we're just highlighting, uh, highlighting the, the issue here. Uh, cable uh, feeder view, just few squares, which shows that the um, uh, at the moment, what is the capacity uh, and what is the load uh, on, on that feeders? So we're showing 2020. It's looking all good. Some a little bit of orange, which means we're getting closer uh, to, 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 to the maximum, but still no reds, which is a good sign. We will jump to 2050 in a minute and you will see the difference. I mentioned about the PI data, so our measurements on the HB feeder, and those are represented here by the blue squares. Okay, so that's showing the existing load. And we've got also domestic and non-domestic load. And you, we can see on feeder 14, there is a little bit of non-domestic load at the moment as well, and feeder 17 as well. So view for 2020, existing load, and where we are with the, with the capacity. So if we jump now to 2050, I think you can see the difference straight away. We've got red sections on the cable on the map as well, clearly visualized you know, where those constraints on the network will be. Also, the, the, the red squares, now it's more and they're more orange as well. So the load picked up and, and we've got some issues on the, on the HV feeders. And you can see where those issues might come from as well. Now the, the, the orange uh, graph shows the domestic and the dark is blue uh, shows non-domestic. So you can see the load pick up on all the feeders. In some cases, the, actually the load from EVs uh, might be higher than, than the load in 2020, the base load in 2020. So the uptake is quite significant and we expect that it will be more than the load on the existing network. Um, below, we can see some capacities uh, of, of uh, available capacity on those feeders, um, which shows again the load, the, the, the changes in the load due to the EV uptake, and when actually we will have uh, or hit the, the maximum limit on the feeder. So, for example, feeder 13, sort of in about uh, 2033, we might be experiencing. Uh, overload on that feeder. Feeder 16 looks particularly uh, bad. You can see the overload could be uh, more than 150%, but it again depends uh, which section of the cables we'll be looking at and what data quality uh, we might have on the network. Okay, just, just switch between 2020 uh, back to 2020 and compare it to 2050. So significant changes uh, uh, on the capacity map. Uh, but as Richard mentioned, we will be looking to, to inform uh, our next price control review how many substations uh, can be or will be overloaded and when, when we need to invest in our network to, to allow for, for connection of the EVs. And this is sort of illustrates very nicely uh, how many uh, substations uh, we will need to reinforce 
uh, in each year. So the graph shows in red the substations which are overloaded or close to overload. Orange is, is very close to overload. And green, we don't have an issue. And you can see, as Richard mentioned, when the EV uptake is quite high, the more and more substations become overloaded and we need to reinforce the network. So in basically in 20, 20, from 2028, 20, 30, 35 is the sort of the biggest, I think, uptake, and that we can see the impact on our assets as well. Below is just a map showing the, where the, the, the physical location of the substations uh, which are overloaded, and it's a nice mixture, really. So again, probably city centers will be more affected than in others, but uh, it, it, it's a nice visual representation. So looking at, uh, again at this, and there are substation views in 2020, very similar uh, as in the previous uh, graph, and just to show different between 2020 uh, and 2050. So a lot of squares uh, here in the, in, in the the bottom left corner goes goes red and you can see as well the location so it pretty much in every single sort of location we will have transformer which, which will be overloaded switching back to 2020 again the difference between green and red is significant and that's the impact of the uptake of EVs uh, on our network so um what what that gives us is the, is the warning where uh, location wise and assets wise when we to uh, uh, invest and but also it will allow us to to to, to work with uh, our customers and the third parties uh, to 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 enable them to connect to predict well where, when and and where uh, those uh, reinforcement on the network will be required and I think that's a uh, just last slide to visualize. Uh, it was last time to visualize, and I'll hand it back to, to Richard. Thanks, Maciej. Um, oh, yep, keep that one up there. Super. So uh, in terms of key insights and next steps, um, the main thing is the bulk of our networks are ready to support this net zero ambition. That's the main thing we've drawn from it. Yes, we've identified a number of uh, potential future constraints, um, but we must remember that these are projections as well. Oh, Actually, we've lost the uh, the slide, buddy. You can bring that back up. If not, I'll, uh, I'll 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 pop it up myself. Bear with me two seconds. I'm going to say it's not a proper webinar without some kind of technical. So I, I didn't touch anything. I didn't change anything. But I'll stop. Changing. I'll I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, yeah, I'll believe you, Matt. I'll believe you. <laughs> There's a lot of people on this call that won't. <laughs> okay, so um, so there we go, folks. Hopefully, you've got that back up there. Um, so, so yeah, the, the main thing is the bulk of our networks we found are ready to support net zero, but where we've identified these potential constraints, we're now looking at it in detail to see what investment is needed. We do have a number of different scenarios and, and gives us some boundaries of confidence with our investment plans. Now, and the next phase of work is looking at how we can use um, other um, methodologies to look at the appropriate investment. It might be in some networks, um, flexibility could be the most appropriate mechanism to manage those constraints. And I've seen a number of questions coming in and flexibility probably will be the answer for a number of those. Um, but in other areas, pure traditional reinforcement might be what's required. Heat pump demand was a key thing that was missing from obviously that analytics piece there. Um, that was effectively our, our proof of concept just to justify um, doing that uh, in more detail and, and building upon it. So building upon that, that proof of concept is now taking place and we will be bringing in heat pump demand to be included in that next iteration. Um, and, and finally, we were aiming to refine the modeling and the, the projections that are being used um, to help support a lot of this local area energy planning that we mentioned uh, to give the bottom up uh, approach and also the engagement with local authorities as well. So in terms of slides, I think that is us. Excellent, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we'll now run through the question and answer session. So we've already got 18 questions in. Um, so, um, I will ask some of these, uh, probably maybe start with some of the um, more technical ones. So uh, we had a question in qu quite early on in the presentation. So I went through sort of 
semi in order. Um, so one of the issues that you'll have is balancing the three phase distribution feeders. Out of balance issues are a high neutral current causing premature failure. How will you balance the loan, the loads um, if home charges are single phase? Yeah, it's a, a very good point and um, probably one where we've done some work in Matre Works on a project um, a couple of years ago. Actually, I can look at the monitor now. The reason why I've been looking slightly ajar, uh, sorry, slightly off to the side is because my monitor is actually working, but my laptop screen is broken, but now I can engage everybody directly. Um, there was a project Matre Works on a few years ago called the New Tens Valley Vision that looked at how we could try and use power electronics um, and storage located down a street to try and help um, actively balance uh, that imbalance uh, along the, the phases but there was some uh, some challenges there around finding the optimal location to site that device um, so as it currently stands aside from perhaps um, digging up and, and reconnecting the service cables of the properties onto a different phase which probably isn't ideal until you've had the confidence that everything's settled down in terms of lct connections um, we'd probably look to try and see if we could use some really granular um, flexibility requests to try and stimulate those customers that are on um, the the, um, the phases that are heavily loaded to try and charge their, their EVs perhaps uh, in different periods and, and try and be a bit more savvy about how we might balance it out. Otherwise, I think, yes, reinforcement is probably the, the way forward. So, so that links to probably the next question maybe. So it says uh, from Malcolm Bird, you seem to consider EV chargers, HPs and solar installations. But what about distributed batteries, e.g. power walls and, and um, those sort of things that we've seen uh, that are on the market? Yep, absolutely. So we recognise that it, it was um, um, limited to those, those LCTs to start with, um, but we are going to be building on it. And there are a lot of other technologies, as you mentioned, that do need to be taken into account. Um, and uh, we're expecting that as this, as this projection tool and as the analytics tool evolves, it will probably end up being quite a complex beast. Um, so we're, we're taking it step by step to make sure that it's able to meet our requirements at each step. But absolutely, um, domestic home storage, um, vehicle to grid, um, the use of hydrogen technologies, for example, might all play a significant role in affecting um, the demands that we expect to see on our networks. Okay, um, that may actually answer the one from Stephen, which was talking about scenarios where three phases divided to homes. Um, so has that been considered? Um, he talks about the park here in Project Shown, it's possible, possibly in the UK. Yeah, so um, we, we don't have um, a lot of homes on three phase uh, yet in the UK. Um, it's definitely something we, we haven't taken into account three phase as a, a development within our projection modeling here. Um, but I know that there is a lot of thought around all new builds in the UK maybe being three phase to allow that accommodation for um, as much low carbon technology demand as possible. Um, and it's certainly something that's an interesting thought. When you're building a new development, uh, building a new network, um, I think it's, it's a marginal cost difference in terms of you know, putting in the additional cable and, and slightly greater assets. The biggest implication comes from retrospectively trying to upgrade networks to three phase. And that's where I think really the onus, as I mentioned at the start, we have a principle around trying to be cost effective. Uh, the onus is on us to try and see if we could use flexibility services to try and maximize our use of those assets, try and really sweat them effectively before having to try and move to that next step of the, uh, in the disruption and passing the cost on to customers for um, digging up um, the, the cables and, and replacing them with a three phase. Okay, so um, so with the models, do, do, the, do the models include new 350 kilowatt rapid chargers rather than the seven kilowatt home chargers? That was from S. White. So on the um, en route national um, charging um, types um, there are a range of uh, chargers i believe that are considered there um, i don't know if we had many of the 350 kilowatt chargers accounted for at that point in time um, but yes it's something that we're looking to include as we do the, the future iterations is always keeping an eye on what's the latest developments and where we see the direction of travel going okay and stacy quake um, asked what proportion of ev chargers are assumed to be smart as a function of future years, uh, and is it ever expected that the DNA might control EV charge output? So in terms of the study, uh, we had, as Maciej showed, the, the profiles that are being devised, and that took into account a lot of the learning um, from projects like uh, other DNOs. So Western Power Distribution had their Electric Nation project, uh, which had nearly 700 EVs, um, and we used the, the um, 
the profiles from those EVs to create our, our low profile. We took into account National Grid did a project as well, looking at charging behaviors. So we used all of that information and, and then factored in a, a level of smart charging uh, across all of them. Um, so I think, uh, I can't remember the exact percentage, we can get back to you on that one, but there was smart charging accounted for uh, in the bulk of the EV um, uptake scenarios. And certainly for our demand profiling, smart does feature heavily. And I guess the last point of that was um, around DNOs trying to influence it. So we have um, the commitment to try and use flexibility first. And so a lot of the DNOs are looking at ways in which we can try and stimulate customer change um, and signal to customers to try and um, yeah, change their, their charging consumption in different ways. Um, so whether that be through a, a, a a direct communication or whether it's through a supplier, whether it's through uh, an aggregator, demand side service provider. Well, there's some interesting stuff coming out from um, British Standards Institute. They have a publicly accessible specification. They've got two actually, um, 1878 and 1879. Uh, they're looking at the, uh, the, the setup for interactions in the energy industry around smart charging and EVs and the potential architecture that might be in there. And grid stability is a key factor within that. So it seems as though there's a good route for networks to try and utilize flexibility to, to manage networks that way. Okay. Uh, Paul Davidson asks, what factors have you considered for new competing technologies and improvements that may come along, improvements to solar cells and hydrogen, etc.? So improvements, I guess, in efficiencies in, in technologies, um, that's something that's going to be built into future iterations of thinking how that efficiency might then reflect on our, our analytics piece. In terms of the uptake, projections. Uh, I don't think it will affect them that much. But in terms of new technologies uh, being available or coming to scale, that obviously will affect the projections. And that's where we'll liaise with our, our, um, our consulting firm, Regen, to support us in making sure that that's accounted for within the scenarios that we, we receive from them. Okay, and, and more topical, uh, what, effect, what effect will working from home uh, take? Oh, I just forgot to spell my off my screen um, take up and use of video conferencing on the face-to-face -face meetings having the amount of vehicle charging required in the future maybe if we're not traveling so, yeah it's an interesting uh, one isn't it um yeah uh, very topical um nothing like a bit of lockdown to sharpen the mind when you're thinking of uh, impacts to um habits um so we had a look through our low voltage substation monitoring um that that, that Mache mentioned and certainly as we've rolled those out onto networks and we've got a couple of hundred networks that we've installed them on to date those networks have been chosen because of the levels of electric vehicle um, chargers that have been connected to them um and we've seen um a a reduction in the amount of energy from those particular networks. Um, so yeah, it, it appears as though it might have an impact on certainly the amount of power that's being drawn um, on our networks. But conversely, when we look at it um, at a higher level, um, I know that our team that, that look at the, the level of uh, use of the system, the distribution use of system side of things, they've seen that if anything, there's been a slight increase. Um, so there's a strange offsetting going between the commercial properties and the, the residential properties um, and potentially the, the EV charging in between. But it's something that we'll be keeping an eye on national grids, COVID analysis or COVID sensitivity um, to see how we should update and reflect that in our models moving forward. So at this point in time, Regen are working on their next stage of projections for us, um, and we should have those ready to uh, publish uh, early next year, and we'll hopefully have the uh, COVID sensitivity taken into account for that. Okay, uh, Andrew's just popped up a, a note that's saying that uh, domestic um, usage has gone up 3.5%. There we go. Interesting yeah. Thanks, um, Andrew. <laughs> While we're looking at the EV situation, what is the overall impact on the, of the move uh, from domestic gas boilers to full electric on the supply situation? Um, so that's a, another loading coming onto the system. So Sorry, David, again. could you repeat that one? So, so uh, we were looking at the EV situation here, mm -hmm. um, but obviously another element is uh, domestic heat um, and, and domestic yep. gas boilers moving to electric. Um, how yep. will that affect? This is interesting. There are there are um, 
different nuances again and you look at the areas where they are already off gas um, and, uh, and and how that um, is, is likely to, uh, to to lead to the uptake of, of heat pumps and then those networks accordingly already being sized for um, you know electric heating to some uh, form or another um, whereas those networks that are typically on a gas network at the minute the diversity that our planners would have built into calculating electrical demand expected to be seen across those networks um, all those many years ago didn't probably factor in the likes of electric vehicles and and heat pumps and the like um, so yes that aspect of residential heat pump uptake is likely to be uh, um, causing a, a few challenges for us and that's why we're really keen to see this next iteration look at what that impact will be um, so we'll hopefully have a nice view of uh, the different scenarios based on you know, high medium and low for simplicity's sake of ev uptake high medium low for heat pump uptake and then what that looks like when you merge them together to have a hopefully that that future scenario of decarbonizing both heat and transport but there's no doubt that it probably will cause us some some challenges for sure okay cool so we've got a few questions here which um the question i'll ask you probably sums up quite nicely and, and you should answer um and cover the, the other one so will the government provide financial support to help with upgrades to the network and will this all be done by ssen investment and could a DNO refuse a connection if the network isn't up to the demand? All righty. So, uh, yeah, so the first one in terms of um, the government have been for a number of years and I believe will continue to be supporting the investment in networks. Um, a lot of the investment they give and the grants are, are for the end users um, so that there's money for customers to get vehicles and charge points. There's grants for local authorities to install on street charges, for example. Um, there's other grants that are being made available. They have their Go Ultra Low Cities Fund. So there's a lot of different revenue streams um, and they've got their £500 million infrastructure fund as well. Um, there's also the, um, yeah, the, the the rapid charging fund. So Project Rapid, looking at how uh, rapid charging can be rolled out across uh, across England. And you know, you, when you look at that, you think that is providing a financial stimulus there to try and get stuff done. And in addition, um, we and other network operators across the UK are going to be making the necessary investments that we feel are appropriate. So a, there is a, a double whammy there um, to achieving this. And then, sorry, David, I've, I've rambled enough to forget the second question what was that one? So the, the second was uh, could a dno a network operator um, refuse a connection if the network isn't up to i don't think it comes down to refusing a connection i think it's a point of saying that there is an investment that's needed and then um, there's a whole raft of um, dialogue that takes place between the connections team within a, a, a DNO and the, the customer that's seeking to make that connection just to explain what the implications are um, and, and then lay out the costs that are needed for the scheme or the reinforcement that's necessary. Um, and again, there's some different rules that go into understanding the apportionment of what a DNO would cover and what the customer would cover. Um, and I won't go into it any more than that because you'll see through my thin veneer of knowledge around the uh, finer points of connections quite quickly. Okay, uh, the modelling considers load demand, but what about the impact on fault levels or power quality? Are these mm. impacts considered or going to be? Yep, so um, Mache and I were, were talking to our analytics team who did that last piece of work that Mache touched on. Um, and uh, we had a, a big long wish list. Um, it was like one of those medieval scrolls when we were unfurling all of our wishes for it. Um, and yes, fault level um, data, um, condition based data, um, you know, health indices, all of that good stuff we were trying to bring in. Um, but we were told, you know, baby steps it's a proof of concept and we need to factor it in so it is on the wish list uh, we will be pushing for it um, um, but it's just going to be taking a bit of time to build in but certainly we need that picture of all those different aspects in order to effectively have a, a, a an up-to-date view really of the networks and I think there was a, a question that came in earlier around you know what is a uh, you know distribution system operator mean and and really this is all moving us towards that point of being able to bring together and allow customers to be consumers, prosumers, to put power back into the grid, to use it when they want, to maybe do peer-to-peer -peer trading. Um, you know, it, 
becomes our role to facilitate all of that. And I think to do that, that's why we have to have a network model like this that can in almost near real time factor in those requests and give perhaps, you know, go or no go decisions um, or perhaps influence different locational signals. Um, so definitely we need to have power quality aspects in there. Voltage needs to be in there. We need to have fault conditions. Yeah, the whole, the whole piece. Okay, and uh, just uh, I'll step through and, and find one final question, uh, which just someone's put something else and it's just disappeared off my screen. Um, yeah, the map showed low EV demand in the west of Scotland. Um, you know, how will you uh, cope with uh, people visiting for tourism and things like that, where we um, might not have um, the usual demand for sort of on street domestic um, use? That's um, yeah, a really good point, actually. And we have an innovation project that we have launched called eTourism. Um, and that's one of the key outputs of our strategic partnership. I mentioned it earlier, one of the case studies in our AV strategy is around this strategic partnership. And it's actually with um, Scottish Government, Transport Scotland, and the other uh, network operator in Scotland, um, SP Energy Networks. Um, and that is looking at that challenge of what happens when you have um, tourists that have electrified their, their transport and they suddenly start going to these areas where um, you know, we, we might have supported the, the connection of charging infrastructure, um, looked at you know, the network, looked at the utilization rates and thought, okay, fair enough. Uh, we could probably manage that in a particular way that the network can take it. Um, but then when you get um, potentially hundreds or even thousands of tourists descending on there, um, you're right, we need to think about how we help uh, those communities and those networks manage it. So the e-tourism project um, has been looking at the solutions that might be needed. Um, and the idea is that we can find solutions for those communities that can help manage that influx of tourist demand um, and uh, and really help them uh, flourish with accommodating that because uh, I think there's there's a, a place up in Scotland, Portree, that has a population of maybe a, a couple of thousand um, and then in the summer months I think that jumps to having about 26,000 visitors. So it's those kind of experiences that we want to try and ensure everybody, locals and tourists, can have a, a positive experience. Then it might, all, it might not always be um, a tech savvy approach that's needed uh, you might even be able to accommodate it with things like a booking system. Um, so, you know, you know, you have a certain slot that's booked for your charger at the next tourist destination, or it might even be something as simple as a, uh, a throwback to, you know, only a few decades ago of using valets uh, to manage parking in situations. So you might have a valet charging system. So there's a lot of different options being explored. Um, and we're really excited to see how the outputs of that can inform um, not just you know, parts of say Western Scotland, for example, um, but other areas across the UK, you only have to look at, you know, festivals, whether they be music festivals, you know, um, air festivals, balloon festivals, railing festivals, the uh, railing, sailing festivals, uh, you know, um, you've got the regatta, you've got the Isle of Wight Cows Festival. When you look at the numbers of visitors that go to these areas, uh, sometimes tops millions of visitors over a number of days. Um, and we're expecting that might place a strain on the local infrastructure. So we are looking at how we can uh, put in place measures to support that. Okay, and probably the last question in view of time, um, and there's several questions related to this. So it's about, um, are you going, you know, do you see cars being used for storing energy? So this is the vehicle to grid um, question. So, so what's your views on on what that looks like going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're they're a, a portable battery, uh, are they not? So um, I think smart charging of vehicles, both to um, you know alleviate some challenges with peak demand on network and uh, maybe even some voltage challenges, it is going to be a go-to for all network operators moving forwards, um, and also putting power back into the grid as well uh, at times of need. Um, so you know it could even just be as simple as putting power back to a property um, to provide that that power and alleviate constraint on the wider network um, or it might actually be something um, as incredible as in a, a, an outage situation a power cut providing that local resilience uh, to, to help bring a specific network back up to, to power so you know we, it could help us with islanding networks uh, we could do that pre or post fault so there's there's a lot of real exciting potential about that stored energy being used to support um, customers in a range of scenarios. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, just one, one last thing that, that popped up on the chat rather than the Q&A. Um, so the, the price control, uh, which is sort of when uh, Ofgem uh, give the settlement for Scottish and Southern Energy Networks for, for the next 
five years, so it's from 2023 to 2028. Um, during that period there will be so, so coming up there will be consultations and things that people can chip into um so if you keep your eye on the opgen website or sign up to their emails um you can then um read the consultations and con um contribute to them um, So, so thank you very much uh, for everyone coming along. Um, th there were lots of questions, so we will look at those after the event. Um, just so you know, uh, the event has been uh, recorded, um, so that we will be able to have that on the IET website for people to go and view, um, and that will be coming up uh, shortly, so watch out for your, your emails and notifications about that. Uh, we've also got uh, several other um, sessions coming up shortly, which we'll uh, advertise when we've confirmed all the details for those. Um, so, so that leaves me, I think, that's all the bits here, um, to, to say thank you very, very much for, for Richard and uh, Jay for, for giving that presentation. Uh, really, really interesting to see the developments going on in the EV world, and, and but also what impact that has on the networks um, and the, the data analytics section uh, was fascinating to look at so thank you very much for that um so as i say th this will be on the it website uh shortly uh so thank you very much everyone for coming along and uh, i hope you have a fantastic evening so thank you very much <laughs>